Hi, I'm Jim Zogby and welcome to Viewpoint. The shooting down last week of a Russian warplane uh, by Turkey on its border with Syria has led to, to strong rhetoric between the two nations' leaders, uh, each uh, accelerating tension uh, with the, in, within the region. And in Lebanon, where a political stalemate has left the country without a president for more than a year and a half, there appears to be in the works a surprising power-sharing proposal. Uh, for analysis of these uh, developing stories and to help unravel the complexities of both, um, I have the Vice President of the Policy and Research at the Middle East Institute. He was a founding director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut and a founder and director of the Lebanese Center for Policy and Studies, a leading think tank in Lebanon, Paul Salem. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Thank you, Jim. Happy to be here. When I said unravel, I meant just that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are complexities almost within complexities in both situations. Um, let's take a look first, if we could, at the, the, the Turkish-Russian conflict over the crash. Uh, what we know, well, we know something, and there's a lot of stuff we don't know. What we know is that the plane was shot down, a bomber was shot down on the 24th of November um, by a much more agile uh, Turkish fighter, fighter jet, an F-16. Um, what's in dispute initially is the route that was taken. Let's take a look. I have a, 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 a screenshot up here of the, of the route that was taken. The, this is where the F-16 approached, and this is the direction. Now, the, the, the Russians say that they went around that little nodule, and the Turks say that they went through it. Um, we also don't know, after the pilots landed, uh, the initial report was that they were taken prisoner, uh, and then it was that they were dead, and the Russians are accusing the Turks of actually, uh, not the Turks, but the Turkomans who captured mm -hmm. them, of mm -hmm. actually shooting them down. We also know that the Russians were actually on a mission to bomb Turkomen, Syrian Turkmen fighters who are allied with some of the extremist groups. So in a sense, it's almost a little bit, um, uh, both sides had that right. They mm -hmm. were uh, bombing uh, Turks, uh, Turkmen anyway, and mm -hmm. the Russians can say we were bombing extremists. Help sort that out. What, what, what do we know beyond that was actually happening here? Well, I mean, what I think is, is more important politically and explains a bit why it led to this and might enlighten us as to how this will develop moving forward. In the midst of this is an incident, but what preceded it, of course, is very dramatic events in Syria itself, uh, that in the few weeks before the Russians entered Syria, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and, and other allies felt that they were gaining on the Assad regime and that the regime uh, might be on the back foot and might eventually fall or lose considerable territory. That is perhaps why President Putin decided to intervene in the first place. So the Russian intervention already upset an enormous sort of sense of, of gain that the Turks and some other allies were making and a, a completely upset that expectation. Uh, secondly, there is, as you mentioned, the Turkmen aspect to this, who are uh, Syrians of Turkish descent. Uh, Syria is a multi-sectarian but multi-ethnic country as well. We all know about the great number of Kurds and the forces fighting there, uh, but there's also Turkmen that uh, Turkey feels a particular sense of protectivity towards. And clearly, they were being targeted by the Russians as other non-ISIS and non-terrorist rebel groups have been targeted uh, since the Russians entered. Uh, so that was the volatile sort of geopolitical mix. Uh, politically, for President Erdogan, President Erdogan had campaigned and won a, a, a kind of a landslide victory in his election based on a, 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 a tilt towards a very nationalist and a very combative position. Uh, so I think, like President Putin himself portrays himself as very aggressive and doesn't, you know, take challenges lightly uh, and has that political persona at home, that's the persona that President Erdogan campaigned on and, and won on. So unfortunately, I think both presidents were driven to more escalation. That, that is what's worrisome about this incident, had it happened between Sweden and Belgium, you would not be worried because it could easily be handled. But this is between two presidents who've painted themselves into very 
nationalistic uh, There are those corners. who suggest that since the Russians have entered, um, the situation hasn't gone anywhere. Actually, I think the president was saying that, and that uh, it's a stalemate. You're suggesting something different, that the Russian uh, involvement has, in fact, made a difference for the regime and given it a second, second wind. Absolutely, it has. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the sense from Hezbollah and others close to the regime and from Russians I've talked to, uh, their intelligence was uh, that the regime was losing ground and that loss of ground could snowball mm -hmm. and could be a game changer. And that was the sense of optimism in the couple of months before the Russians intervened that you sensed in Turkey and elsewhere. Uh, the Russian intervention, I think, has created a stalemate. Uh, the stalemate was falling apart previously. Definitely, uh, the regime feels almost, I would almost say that it's, it's out of the woods. Uh, it's not going to win. It's not going to regain most of its lost territory. But it and its supporters no longer feel that its survival, maybe as a rump state, is, is deeply in question at this point. So yes, it has changed the situation in that sense. Unfortunately, the Russian intervention, although trumpeted to be against ISIS, the Russians have not done very much against ISIS. Most of their firepower has been against other rebel groups. So the fight against ISIS is also at a stalemate. Rebel groups that the Russians say are terrorist groups, much like the regime in, in uh, Damascus, who says they're terrorist groups. But they were Turkmen in this case. And that's the other interesting issue here that you raise. Um, the government of, uh, of President Erdogan um, has a not just nationalist, but almost a racialist mm -hmm. uh, approach to people of Turkic descent. Their gripe with the Russians also goes to Ukraine with the seizure uh, by Russia of the, the Crimean um, Peninsula where are, and yeah. where there's mm -hmm. a, a Crimean Tartar, a Turkish group, um, and with some of the former Soviet republics that are also mm -hmm. Turkic mm -hmm. um, in, in ancestry. Um, this notion of almost a, a Turkish multinational empire is a, is a big concern. Well, I mean, you're very right. Maybe I, 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 miss, I misspoke or I should have been clear that in his presidential campaign, he campaigned uh, on Turkish, a lot of the Turkish-Kurdish tensions. Obviously, mm -hmm. Kurds, the Kurds in Turkey are Turks, but there's an ethnic uh, division, and there's been, since the days of the Republic, uh, high tensions over that issue and an attempt by the Turkish majority to Turkify the Kurds and prevent them to use the Kurdish language and so on. So yes, it's a very Turkic nationalist, if you will, uh, campaign. Uh, on the Russian side, uh, their attacks on non-ISIS and non-terrorist rebel groups stems from, from their view or Putin's view that really what he's defending in Syria is the principle of state sovereignty uh, that was violated in Libya, that, that, uh, that the U.S., that, that Russia feels that the U.S., after the Cold War, has presented the idea of the right to do regime change uh, mm -hmm. and that you can intervene in countries to change their governments if you don't like their policies or if they are oppressive to their own people. Uh, that happened in Libya, and the Russians were not happy with the results of that. So when I've asked uh, Russian colleagues, what's the justification for hitting other groups? They say, well, we are in the business of rebuilding state stability and state order. Yes, there are political problems in Syria, and yes, we favor a negotiation and a transition, but armed revolution backed by foreign powers is not something that they countenance. And they also feel that in order to eventually defeat ISIS, they have to strengthen the state and the regime and weaken all of its enemies first. Now that's a very controversial policy, mm -hmm. but that's how they explain it. There are different takes on, on what is transpiring at this point. Um, I, I've read articles uh, in the Arab press suggesting that Russia was humiliated and that Russia was dealt a blow by uh, Erdogan, Turkey being actually a, a, one of the G20. It's a fairly substantial power, but nothing equal to, to that of Russia. And then there are those who are saying, on the other hand, that uh, it's Turkey that lost this round and became isolated 
uh, for its adventurous policies. Now, I noted that the president recently, President Obama, had some very supportive things to say of Turkey, but even Arab allies on the same side as Turkey have not been coming forward um, and viewed this attack on Russia as possibly complicating the, the push toward a solution. Tell me where you think the, the situation comes out. Was this a win or a loss for Turkey, uh, a win or a loss for Russia? Well, I think it really depends how you're trying to measure wins and losses. I mean, I think on the face of it, in terms of prestige, President Putin, uh, with the bombing of the airliner in uh, Sinai and the downing of one of his aircraft by, you might say, a second-tier power, not even a global mm -hmm. power, is a humiliation. You know, he charged into Syria on a high horse and saying he's going to you know, achieve success, and here he loses, you know, 330 citizens, and then he loses one of his, his bombers to a second-tier player. So clearly there, there is a loss of face. Uh, on the Turkish side, I think Turkey and President Erdogan, from his calculations, he looks tough. You know, his Air Force did well, as it were. Uh, but if you look at the cost of all of this, uh, there are many, obviously, even in Russia, questioning the cost-benefit analysis of Putin's adventure in the Levant. I mean, America tried that, and it cost <laughs> several trillion dollars, and it got nothing for it. Yeah, it kind of looks tough and, and good for a little while, but many people are saying this Russian adventure has no happy ending and is not beneficial. Uh, for Turkey, simply the economic uh, decisions that Russia has taken in the last few weeks, and they will likely deepen, uh, that relate to tourism, energy, uh, trade, uh, that is a high cost uh, for anybody to, to pay. Obviously, I think it brings us back to you know, the reality that any international proxy war like Syria is, at the end of the day, is a lose-lose. And that's why I hope you know, attention is focused on how to, you know, how to resolve it rather than who's going to shoot down whose planes. Turkey is, uh, Russia has threatened to retaliate. Uh, they have a trade uh, with Turkey has grown significantly in the last 15 years from 20 billion to almost uh, over 100 billion. Um, and Turkey is dependent on Russian gas. Uh, so they have some stuff they can do. Let's take a look at what Turkey might do. Uh, there's been some talk about, we have a map here of the, um, of the Black Sea. And since the days of the Tsar, there's mm -hmm. always been the talk of Russia needing a warm water port. Um, and then the Soviet Union in search of a warm water port. And now they have a base here in, in Latakia. Mm -hmm. But uh, traveling through the Straits of Dardanelles and Bosporus, uh, Russia needs access, and Turkey actually controls both. It would be a violation of international law for Turkey to shut those straits, but that's something that they could do, which would deny Turkey, uh, Russia rather, access mm -hmm. to its port in Syria and its ability to resupply. Mm -hmm. um, talk first about the Russian retaliation, and then secondly about whether or not you can expect a Turkish retaliation. Well, first of Russia all, I mean, to. in recent reports I've seen over the last few days that track ship by ship, uh, they are finding, and these are sort of third-party reports that you know, can track ships through their sort of GPS systems, that there are no Russian ships going through the Straits uh, of the Dardanelles, and that they are all still in the Black Sea and there's no movement, uh, which indicates that at least for now, possibly it's caution, possibly it's, you know, a moment of high tension, that the Turks either are threatening or are actually blocking Russian, Russian shipping, and that is extremely serious for the Russians. Uh, Turkey definitely is very dependent on, uh, I wouldn't say dependent, but has great benefits from uh, Russian gas, from Russian tourism, about three million or more tourists to Turkey. It became a regular destination and, and lots of trade, uh, foodstuffs, textiles, a whole bunch of things. And if you, I'm sure you've been in Istanbul recently, they're almost Russian marketplaces. I mean, a number of Russians there is, is quite astounding. I think the pain, though, would go both ways. Russia benefits and Russians benefit uh, from having open access in Turkey, and Turkey benefits as well. On the oil and gas issue, at the time that this is happening, Iran is getting out of sanctions, and Iran has mm -hmm. enormous oil and gas resources, and Turkey hopes to be a main conduit of Iranian oil and gas 
to Europe. And that's been actually a point of contention between Russia and Turkey, who's going to feed, uh, feed Europe. Uh, I think, though, this crisis, given that Turkey and Russia have so much in, I mean, have so many common interests, and they're so obvious, uh, that uh, I would think, and we've seen some indications of that, that uh, this is you know, an, an area where diplomacy, this is what diplomacy is for, is to diffuse you know, flashpoints like this among countries who have so much in common, who have no interest in direct conflict. I mean, nobody wants to think of a repeat of World War I and blockading of the Dardanelles and world war between Russia and Turkey. Yeah. We're not gonna go there, but uh, this is why I'm heartened that there, you know, that there's a, uh, you know, we've had success in the Iran P5 plus one, that was tough. We've had Vienna talks over Syria. We just had a G20 meeting in Turkey. Uh, so I think there's diplomatic capacity to move out of this. I think Foreign Minister Lavrov is about, a very wise voice. Let's talk about both the mm -hmm. Iran situation and the relationship Russia, Iran, Turkey, Iran. But then first about the Vienna meeting, which um, tabled some tentative proposals. Um, almost a recognition, uh, if, if anything was accomplished, it was the stated recognition by all parties that a political solution was necessary. Mm -hmm. We're beyond the victor vanquished scenario. The question is, what will a compromise look like? And there's profound disagreement on, on that. Um, Russia and Turkey have wildly different um, expectations of what a resolution looks like. Russia wants to protect its ally, Bashar al-Assad, and Turkey wants him to go. Um, there's also a difference of opinion in terms of what groups, what Syrian opposition groups participate. Uh, the Russians have some clear red lines on the groups they're currently bombing that they feel are, while not ISIS and not necessarily Jabhat Nusra, are allied with Jabhat Nusra and therefore are off the table. Um, and Turkey is an ally of many of these groups and has been supplying them and allowing the movement of, mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of personnel across the border, et cetera. Um, how do we, will this current, the bombing situation and the fallout prove to be uh, an obstacle to the Vienna talks moving forward? Well, I think the Vienna talks reflect a number of things that have changed in the game. One is that Russia is now perhaps the main player in Syria. It wasn't before it mm -hmm. entered. Uh, that also means that President Assad is no longer, at the end of the day, the dominant player in Syria. He had already lost a lot of power to the Iranians and to Hezbollah, who ran most of the battles and were in, largely in control. With President Putin and Russia with such a large footprint now in Syria, uh, that further weakens uh, President Assad as somebody who can control or call all the shots. Uh, it is also the case that President Putin has gotten himself into a quandary in Syria. Uh, he's made the move. He wants to stay in Syria and he wants to ex you know, extend Russian power in that sense. But at the same time, w as months go by, he is more urgently in need of some political resolution. And he has more levers to exercise inside Syria to get a, a deal done. That is different. Secondly, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states in the same period have gotten mired in Yemen. Uh, almost most of their attention used to be on Syria. It is now largely shifted to Yemen and their resources have shifted to Yemen. And at a time when oil prices are low, that changes their willingness to accept things or to, or to not accept things. And, and the presence of Russia in Syria, as we talked about previously, also tells the Turks and the Saudis that you're going to have to accept a compromise. Turkey's, I mean, Russia is now on the table. You're not going to defeat Russia in a 100% sense. All of those are new dynamics. In addition, Iran is now at the table. It wasn't there before, and it now has a nuclear deal and has other things to look forward to. So I think the Vienna talks reflect uh, changes in the game. Uh, at the same time, this is a very complicated situation and a very complicated game. I think it will take years to resolve, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's very important that a process has been started. The idea of a ceasefire is key. Uh, the idea of talks to draft the outlines of a constitution are key. 
and then beginning to think about an election now. It says within a year and a half after January, maybe it's three years, maybe it's two years, but uh, uh, I think that process has begun and that's a very positive One thing. final question before we shift to Lebanon in the closing minutes. In, uh, in, just recently, uh, Putin went to Tehran and met with uh, President Rouhani and talked both about uh, consolidating their commercial ties but also their deep coordination of military strategy in Iraq and also in Syria. The Iraq one has caused the U.S. some, some, uh, some angst because you have Russia and Iran and the Iraqi government mm -hmm. uh, coordinating, coordinating strategy there. Um, the commercial one, though, you noted about Turkey wanting to be the conduit for Iran, but Russia does have a lever there. They can, they can trump Turkey in Iran if, 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 uh, if, if they play their cards right. Is Iran now, after P5 plus one, going to become a bargaining chip for countries competing for its favors? Uh, I think it will be in a position to choose its favors. What's interesting is that the Gulf countries were worried that after the nuclear deal, the US and Iran would be in cahoots. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's Russia that's jumped on the nuclear deal to become Tehran's friend. Uh, uh, Russia has now relation, you know, strong re partnership with Tehran, strong partnership with Damascus. It will build a strong partnership with Baghdad, with the, particularly with the Iraqi army, because Iran is not comfortable with a U.S. trained Iraqi army. It would be more comfortable with a Russian one. And Russia has great relations with President Sisi of Egypt. So you have this huge arc of Russian influence. In terms of economic interests, they're not, they're, they're, uh, they are over nuclear civilian power, which is a main export for Russia, and there could be more of that, and it could be in the aviation and military hardware. In terms of oil and gas, Russia and Iran are competitors, and they will always be. Uh, physically, for Russia to get its oil and gas to market, it either has to go east towards Pakistan and China, or west through Turkey to Europe, and I think that will remain the case. Uh, Iranians are deeply suspicious of Russia, there's centuries of suspicion. I was in Iran recently, and they said, you know, we, we get what Putin is doing, but they said, we understand that the historic position of Russia has two pillars. One, keep Iran weak, and two, make sure Iran isn't part of a Western alliance. Mm -hmm. So they have no illusions about their relationship with Russia, uh, and I think uh, Tehran will choose its relationships, will make use of its relationship with Russia, its relationship with Turkey, but also its relationships with mm -hmm. Pakistan and China moving, because that's where the future of energy is, it's east. Let's move to Lebanon, no less complicated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We've got only Much about smaller. <laughs> well, five minutes to, to go, All since right. I, I'm, I'm sure that our viewers aren't aware of the, the, I guess the word Byzantine is used a lot, the, the intricacies of Lebanese lot, politics. Yes. I just put up a board here uh, that describes how the parliament is shaped in, mm -hmm. in Lebanon bisect uh, with a Christian edge um, uh, that's actually 64, 64. It, it, yeah, it's 50, 50. Yeah. It's equality it's, at this it, point. It, yeah. There was a Christian edge before Taif, yeah. and it's now 50, 50. And the president is always a Maronite Catholic. Yes. Uh, the prime minister is always a Sunni Muslim. That's and right. the Speaker of the House is always uh, a Shia Muslim. He is there has not been a president for 18 months because the parliament can't agree on a, mm -hmm. a two-thirds to elect. Uh, and the parliament itself has not been elected and, and has had to extend its term because they can't come to an agreement on electoral law. Mm -hmm. And there's news of a breakthrough. So without getting too thick into the weeds and describing who some of the players are, Tell me about the breakthrough we're, we're reading about and whether or not there's any hope that this stalemate in, in Lebanon, which is, I guess, could be a conservative's dream, where they want an American conservative's dream. They want no government. Lebanon basically has no it. government. <laughs> yeah. Well, is, there a, say, is there yeah. a deal in the works, and what would it look like if there were one? Well, let me say something that I think is very significant, that... Yes, the Lebanese governance system is very complex and often not very effective, but Lebanon is almost a miraculous success story in today's Middle East of Christians, uh, Christians and Muslims living together, Sunnis and Shiites living together in a very open and free society. 
uh, where two hours down the road people are being beheaded and genocide is, 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 is being uh, you know, implemented. So this example of coexistence peacefully in an open, democratic, somewhat dysfunctional, like occasionally the US government is, uh, is something uh, rather miraculous, I would say, and rather marvelous, and uh, something that I hope uh, some of the better lessons could be learned uh, for Iraq and Syria, which yet haven't figured out how Sunnis and Shias can live together without, without killing each other and so on. Uh, there's been, yes, a stalemate for 18 months because the two major camps, one is allied with the Assad regime in Syria and one is against the Assad regime in Syria. Uh, luckily, those two camps haven't gone at it in Lebanon, so we've had peace, but the price has been political deadlock. Uh, and one of the uh, uh, deadlocks has resulted in inability to elect a new president. Now we're hearing of a possible deal uh, that may have been brokered by uh, Mr. Saad Hariri, who's the leader of the anti-Assad bloc, if you want. Uh, and, and a Sunni Muslim. A, a Sunni bloc, which yeah. has also uh, Christian allies. Uh, reaching out to a Christian Maronite Catholic leader who's in the pro-Assad camp and pro-Hezbollah camp, whose name is Suleiman Frangi, a leader from North Lebanon, suggesting maybe Mr. Frangi uh, could possibly be elected president and Mr. Hariri or one of his nominees uh, would become prime minister. Uh, it gets very arcane and it gets... Uh, as complex as who's going to be the speaker of the house in the US and who's up and who's down. Uh, but Lebanon needs a president after the, if we do get a president, then the country needs to organize parliamentary elections. As you say, the current parliament simply extended its own mandate, but effectively it's illegitimate. Uh, and we also have local elections uh, on the books uh, for next spring. So this fragile, curious democracy in the Middle East has been going through tough times, but it's preserved peace and coexistence. If we can regain governance, that would be good as well. The US, I would say, and the US ambassador has been very active and helpful in moving this along. And it shows uh, that the US, despite what you know, a lot of people say, still has many roles to play, uh, both large and small. The, the, we have a minute left. The articles that I've been reading suggest something also miraculous, not only about the Lebanese agreeing, but that the, uh, the Iranians, the Saudis, the Americans, everyone has bought into this. So there seems to be a, a, a regional stake in Lebanon having stability. Well, that stake has been there for several years, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, and the, what happened with the problem of the presidency was almost you know, a personal political problem among candidates. It did not reflect a standoff between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Actually, while war was being prosecuted by proxy between Iran and Saudi Arabia and Syria, uh, the same proxy clients in Lebanon were, are in government together. They share in a national unity government. Uh, uh, so this is not a change in the regional situation. It's sort of a detail that enabled the situation to break through. But what's important about what you just remarked is that Iran and the Gulf countries like they sort of have found an accommodation in Lebanon that indicates that should be possible. It is possible in Syria. In Syria and in right. Iraq, uh, rather than going at it. Thank you so much Thank for you, unraveling both. It totally both unraveled now. Both now what do we do? That's all the time we've got. For more information, you can follow us and get more information on Lebanon and on Syria on Twitter at AAIUSA or check out our website at AAIUSA.org. Thanks for watching. Thanks to Paul Salem for joining us, and I'll see you next week on Viewpoint.